Annyeonghaseyo, and hello everyone. I am Tupa Intiaz from the Electrical Engineering Department at KAIST, and I'm one of the two moderators for today's episode of the KAIST Ultimate Question Lecture Series. The burning question for today's discussion is, what is the nature of dark matter in our universe? We're all com comfortably familiar with the nature and existence of visible matter, but what is this dark matter about? How does it behave? Can we see it? So to answer these and many more questions, we will be learning today from an expert on the topic, Professor Yanis. Eden, can you please tell us more about the professor? Sure, thank you, Toba. Hello, everyone. My name is Aiden Vinega. Hello, Professor and our panelists. Uh, today, I'm going to be the second prof uh, the second moderator for this uh, KAIS Ultimate Questions uh, series. Uh, so, uh, Professor Yanis Samadidis, he is a professor of physics in KAIS, Depart in Kais University. Uh, and he is also a director of IBS Center of Axion and Precision Physics. And not only that, he is also uh, working in the Parkhaven National Laboratory Physics Department. And also uh, uh, he is going to give us uh, one of the most interesting lecture on dark matters. Before that, let me give a chance to our panelists to introduce themselves. Hello everyone. My name is Din Mohamed Maliwai and I'm second year undergraduate electrical engineering student at KAIST. Hello everyone, my name is Felipe Kondo from Ecuador, Mechanical Engineering Department. Thank you to be here. Thank you very much. Well, without further ado, I'm going to invite our professor to give us the lecture. Hello, my name is Yanis Semergidis. I'm a professor of physics here at KAIST, at the physics department. Today's lecture is about dark matter and searching for it at KAIST. The, at the end of the lecture, you are going to find out the evidence of dark matter, but also how we can make it visible. And most importantly, how the IBS Center for Action and Precision Physics here at KAIST rose to, the, to be the best in our field, in the world. And you'll see what makes, what makes these centers so good. These are my colleagues a lot of great people. Uh, it takes a lot of great people to do great science. Dark matter. The evidence of dark matter. How do we know? Why do we believe there is dark matter? Why is the evidence so overwhelming? We know from uh, Newton uh, that uh, the, the force that uh, holds the planets together is gravitational, right? And uh, there is something very strange. If you measure the velocity of the planet, you can actually weigh the mass. You can find out what is the mass of the sun. Just looking at the velocity of the planets. As a matter of fact, the velocity of the planet doesn't depend on its mass. All right? It's just uh, you measure the velocity and the distance from the sun, and you know everything you need to know. You know the mass of the, of the sun. All right? As a matter of fact, this is the, uh, the way we weigh the mass enclosed by the planet, or in a galaxy, the mass enclosed by the star. Okay? So when you move around a galaxy, you can find out what is the mass all the mass that is enclosed inside that orbit. You do it at the scale, the astronomical scale, one astronomical unit, right, from here to the Sun, and, uh, and you find out that Newton is correct. For Mercury, you have to put a little bit of Einstein to correct for gravitational uh, general relativity effects, and then everything makes sense beautifully. Okay, let's apply this to the grander scale, go to the galaxy scale, and what we find out that um, things are different. Now, in terms of galactic scale, how old do you think you are? Okay, as far as the Earth concerns, we are all 18 galactic years old. That's because our solar system made 18 turns around, in the, around the galaxy already. And do you know the speed uh, with which you, you move around? Every single one of us moves 
with a speed, an overwhelming speed of 0.1% of the speed of light. This is incredible, absolutely incredible. But the stranger thing is that there isn't much mass inside the, the solar trace, the solar orbit, to explain why we are not thrown out of the galaxy. We should have been thrown out already, all right? And that's the reason we believe there is dark matter in there. So the first evidence, the real evidence uh, of that came in the 30s. It was a little bit of an obscure argument. People didn't understand it as much. But it was uh, Rubin who, uh, this is Professor Vera Rubin, who uh, measured the velocity of the stars as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. And she found something very strange. That velocity never goes down. It keeps going at the same speed, all of them. This is very strange. I mean, it seems like the galaxy is much bigger than we can see, the, the stars we see, much, much bigger. And, and it doesn't matter how far out we go, we find that there is something that, uh, it's still, there is more mass there. Mass, all right? And that is the evidence of dark matter. This was the first time that the dark matter became realistic. It was a woman who discovered that. Uh, Professor Vera Rubin passed away in 2016 at the age of 88. She was a true pioneer, all right? But people may say, you know, maybe Newton is not correct when the scale becomes too big, right? Aha. Uh -huh. They found a galaxy that doesn't have dark matter. It was formed without the need of dark matter, all right? Now, why is this important? It's, it's important because you know Newton is correct. Because that follows exactly Newton's law to that scale. But when it comes, uh, he, the mechanism of creating it was different. So the law is correct, all right? But most of the galaxies are built with the dark matter. There is one thing about the, uh, the dark matter. We know our universe is about 13 billion years old, right? If there wasn't dark matter, the coalescence of matter wouldn't happen fast enough for you to be here and ask the question, why? So you owe your very existence to the, to the mere fact that dark matter was there, all right? And the next thing, uh, also you should know that our galaxy has dark matter. Okay, the galaxy you see over here is actually the velocities about one third of the velocities in our galaxy. So they are much less, all right? So as, as I say over there, a galaxy without dark matter effectively confirming dark matter. Dark matter, why do we call it dark? We can see dark, right? It absorbs light and you can see it, right? The reason it was called dark is because it doesn't radiate. But a more correct name should have been transparent. It's like uh, it's something you don't see. Light goes through it and you don't see it. It's invisible matter. It would have been a better name. All right? But now we are stuck with dark matter. Might as well embrace it as, as far as we, as we understand it. Okay. So that's what we, we call dark matter, transparent or invisible matter, all right? A characteristic of matter is that it clumps together. It likes to be together. It comes together. So when we look at the, how the galaxies are clumped together, we find the so-called large-scale structure. And that requires dark matter to, to happen that way. Otherwise, the theories can never get it together. You can never reproduce that. Another thing that happens, you probably know that, light bends around matter, all right? It bends around dark matter too, 
So you can, uh, you can have light bending around uh, dark matter. Something you don't see, you may be able to see. OK? Um, and here, you can see two clusters of galaxies just uh, going through each other. It takes about a billion years to do. Yeah? And, and what happens is the normal matter interacts with each other. So it slows down because of that interaction. And the dark matter goes and it's on the blue side. So the red, the red uh, parts of the screen are x-rays. We see x-rays from there. So we see the, uh, the regular matter. We see it. And the dark matter is just uh, uh, moved out, disconnected, is lost of the regular matter. Wait a second. I just told you that we can't see dark matter. So how can we see that there is dark matter? Well, we see because we see Einstein's rings, light bends behind it, right? So behind it, we see that uh, there is a lot of Einstein's rings. And we found that, that these are the dark matter. The evidence of dark matter is right there in front of us to see. All right? So the dark matter, the blue things you see on the screen, it just moves and affects it. And because it interacts with regular matter very, very little. OK, here it is. The blue regions show where most of the mass is, all right? Because dark matter is much more than the regular matter, about five times. And uh, you see that by gravitational lensing of the background galaxies. OK, so we discovered dark matter. There is no question about that. OK, so whenever you ask me, how do you know it has dark matter? That we know. Well, the evidence is overwhelming. What do we do about it? All right? It could be an axion field. Uh, it solves another problem in strong interactions. I mean, it's a fundamental problem. So he, the particle physicists didn't have to invent the notion of, of uh, axions. It looks like the Higgs field, like uh, if you heard about the LHC discovered that. Only the axions is, uh, is a different type. It violates parity and so on. Uh, what it does. It's like a cosmic maser. Right here, there is a field. You can't touch it, smell it, or, or see it, but it's right there. And that field oscillates at one frequency, one frequency, which you don't know what frequency, what is that frequency, but it does. And that is the, the glue that holds the galaxy together, all the stars together. That's it. All right. How do we make it uh, appear? How do we make it visible? It's dark. How you can't see it? Well, you turn on a magnetic field, DC magnetic field, and then you have a very faint flickering electric field going on like that. I'll give you an example: ten tesla of uh, magnetic field. Ten tesla magnetic field is a lot of magnetic field, and then you create about a peak of volt per meter. It's impossible to see. All right. It's like your cell phone. Your cell phone works at 2 gigahertz, right? This could be, the action could be around there, 2 gigahertz. And, but the power is just very different. Orders and orders of magnitude very different. Okay. So it's a cosmic maser, and it reveals itself with magnetic fields. You need a microwave cavity, high quality resonators, and so on, amplifiers, state of the art, quantum noise limited amplifiers. You put, you embed this in the cryostats, and you go to a near absolute zero. Nothing moves. The electrons cannot move. It's very, very, very little. And to get the, the hint that there is an axion like that. So this is how it would look like the axions so the axion field is inside the magnetic field. It transforms into RF photons, very few photons uh, per second, and they, uh, you hope you detect it. It's extremely difficult. As you see, you would tune the resonator, and at some point you hear noise. That noise is like the universe whispering to you 
the secrets of the creation. And he's talking to you how all the axion field is passing by Earth, the whole thing. And at all sorts of frequencies, how narrow this frequency is, little lines back and forth and so on. Now you open up another field, that of axion astrophysics, if you discover that. And it's just an amazing thing to discover, to find out another picture. You can look at the, pic the universe itself uh, with a different window. That's what axion astrophysics will provide. All right? And by the way, the power that we are able to detect is like going to Mars. It takes a long time to go to Mars, all right? It takes seven months or something. That's the shortest, okay? And then you have a cell phone over there, and we, our system, our receiver, would still have four bars, okay? No other system. Your cell phone cannot do this. Okay, so this is what we built at the Munji campus here at uh, uh, KAIST, and we have several experiments, and I mean, it's state of the art, and it's absolutely amazing system, the best in the world, and that is the 12 TB, the 12 Tesla magnet. This is the biggest magnet in Korea for sure. Absolutely. Nobody else in Korea has this magnet. It's going to be powered this month. We are going to turn it on this month. And that's when the phase transition comes in our field. And, and we are talking about the 100 photons to 1,000 photons. Whereas your cell phone to work, you need trillions and trillions of photons to, to do. Otherwise, you don't hear it. You say, what? What? No. But we can hear 100 photons and you say, oh, there is an axion in that frequency, all right? That is the difference. This is, you put the big with the very small and everything together. Everything has to be perfect for this to work, okay? And so at the end, and just to let you know, below 10K is very hard to do, but below 1K, is entirely different frequency. I mean, you really need to have the world's experts working on the experiment. And this is what we gathered over here. We have the best people in the world working on that in, with innovation and coming together, collaborating. Otherwise, you can't do this kind of experiments. We can reach where we need to be. And we will do first one to eight gigahertz and then all the way to 25 gigahertz people. This is from international uh, reviews. They, they, say, they say this is our uh, region of, uh, of uh, uh, sensitivity. And there are many, many experiments around the world competing for the same thing. But I have to tell you, everybody is very smart the best institutions in the world, but we are on our way to be the top very best in the world. And, and when that happens, it's going to be a transformational uh, point uh, for KAIS too, because there aren't many things. We are the really top uh, in the world in basic science, which is not trivial to do. Okay, we had, um, uh, workshop on Jeju Island 2016. We organized this. It's an amazing place. I recommend it. And uh, last year, this is in Germany. We had it in Freiburg. Uh, of course, this year, this, this uh, meeting we have every year, but this year we couldn't do this. And we had to uh, rely on uh, online meetings. And it's not the same. Why? Because our science is also social science. You need to be able to communicate, talk, negotiate face to face. Okay? And, and you always want to say your idea a little bit so the other person can say a little bit and so on. You're constantly negotiating and trying to understand where are they going, what kind of, of things they are looking after and so on. They are smart people. They are not dummies, these people, all right? Okay, so to, to finish it, 
Um, at IBS CAPP at KAIST, we have a world-class institute, top of our field in just seven years. Only Korea can do this, all right? There is no other place in the world that can do th such things. Within five years, we'll have one to eight gigahertz with axions assuming 100% of, of the dark matter. And the next uh, 10 years, one to 25 gigahertz, and we'll have such sensitivity, nobody else in the world can do that, down to 10% of dark matter, all right? It's hard, but very fun work. It really, um, we are all enjoying doing that. I mean, absolutely pleasure, okay? So, any questions you have? Thank you, Professor, for the very inspiring and informative lecture. I was wondering, what is the significance of this research? As in, like, what kind of breakthroughs can we expect from this research? This is a very good question. Dark matter, the topic of dark matter is one of the uh, top 10 most important questions in particle physics today, internationally. So you have a large fraction of the best scientists in the world working on this topic. One of the most uh, um, promising candidates for dark matter is the so-called axion field. And if we can make that happen, we'll open up a new field, that of the axion astrophysics. And, and with that comes a new picture of the universe, and that's just amazing. So the, the benefit is uh, intellectual. The, the physics uh, 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 reach is just incredibly important. But then you also have uh, uh, something on the side. The, what you gain is the fact that people, scientists, need to work together to be very innovative, to be able to reach the best uh, sensitivity in the world. And, uh, and that, everybody would be envious uh, having that. Thank you. I have a question related to your lecture, and uh, that was related to an animation we saw when the galaxies were merging. Um, you said that dark matter and regular matter kind of didn't interact. However, we definitely know that dark matter has mass, and it must interact with the usual matter with uh, internal gravitational interactions. So, um, did they not interact at all, or is it some a special kind of interaction we couldn't observe just usually? What was it? Oh, that's a brilliant question. The, it's a, a matter of time constants. Eventually, they'll come together, because uh, when uh, friction comes on, because friction is much stronger than the gravitational interaction, so they dislodged because of friction, but eventually, the, you'll see that the matter will go I towards dark matter and they will merge again. But we caught them in the act. That is uh, the, the idea. I see. Thank you. Professor, I have another question. When I look up on the internet about dark matter, it also shows up dark energy. So you could you explain to me what's the difference or where it's idea going on? Dark matter is matter. It, it has, uh, we, we know that much. Uh, but the moment you talk about dark energy, the equation of state changes. It is, uh, the dark energy is very different. We don't really know what it is. And we are still finding, trying to find ways to, to look for it. And lately, people uh, are are looking for experiments that are sensitive to fluctuations, local fluctuations in densities of energies, uh, uh, as opposed to the dark matter, which is, interacts differently. Uh, the, in, uh, the difference is a little too subtle to, to be able to explain in, in here. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, professor, uh, from your lecture, one of the interesting things I grasped it is that uh, it's possible to actually see the dark matter when, uh, because the light beam destroys the dark matter. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. most inter interesting capture that I right, had. Right. So, is there a possibility to uh, make it on real time? Is it possible to let like, the dark matter appear, the dark matter stream appear on real time? Well, there are experiments looking for those. It depends on the nature of dark matter. We know dark matter is there, 
right? But it could be WIMPs, weakly interacti interactive massive particles. It could be axions. And the way you look for those things are very different. The experimental techniques are very different. So once we know what it is, we will have real time animation of what is happening. I promise you that. If it is axion, then definitely I promise you that. As a follow-up from that question, um, once we launch this facility to be able to detect axons at much more uh, greater um, sensitivity, will we be? Um, what if what if it turns out that the, those are not axons? Will we be sure that this is WIMPs or um, are there still other theories, hypotheses? It's possible. Yeah, I'm an experimentalist, so in that regard, I'm an agnostic. And the way I say to, I talk with our scientists is, you know, my duty is not to, to guarantee that the axion is there. My duty is to have the sensitivity to, un to see it if it is there. So between 1 and 25 gigahertz, if it's there, we will see it. And that is a promise. Yeah. Professor, one more question about dark matter for me. So basically, in the universe, we have dark matter and normal matter. So which one do we have more in the universe, dark matter or normal matter? Dark matter, according to the models, uh, because there are many ways of looking at the problem, 70% is dark energy, the energy content of our universe. It changes as a function of time, by the way. And dark matter is about 27%, and normal matter, 4%. So you, you see, it's dark matter is a little over six times that of ordinary matter. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, I have a question. So you mentioned all the work that is being, like all the open research in the field. So my question is, what are the, can you list one or two most important open questions in the research at the moment? Other kind of uh, mm -hmm. questions? You see, when we do experiments in the lab, matter and antimatter appears most of the time in equal amounts. But have you seen antimatter lately around here? No, right? Right. I mean, but looking at the number of photons that are around, so we figured matter and antimatter mostly annihilated at the early stages of the universe. And what stayed is one in 10 billion. One in 10 billion, this is a tiny fraction. But still, we don't understand how this can be so. According to all the physics we know, it should have been much, much less. One in, uh, in 10 to the 18, that's 18 zeros after the, the 10. So we are missing nine orders of magnitude in understanding, uh, right? And this is called the matter-antimatter mystery of the universe. And that's one of the top uh, mysteries as well. We are also involved uh, on an experiment that could do that. It's also connected with the axion, the so-called storage ring, electrodipole moment of the proton. So we are also have a leading role in that, in that experiment. So this is the second uh, important thing we are doing here. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, well, <laughs> So uh, one of my uh, questions that I have is just not based on the lecture, but uh, something I taught. Uh, this The dark matter is related more on f physics. It's a physical study. But uh, how about other departments? Do you think that they can contribute something to uh, the uh, study of dark matter? The research? Definitely. De definitely. Here in KAIST, we have the best people in condensed matter. I mean, this is what Korea is, right? It uh, is about, and uh, we are collaborating with them. And we recently had a major breakthrough because of that collaboration, and that is to be able to have a superconducting cavity in the presence of a strong magnetic field. Nobody else in the world has that, and this is done here for the first time. And we are still the pioneers on that, and that's amazing. All right, and this is I believe that. This is only possible over here because of the fundamental ways uh, Korea is advanced in contains matter. Interesting. Professor, one question. 
what's the next step after you if you're successful with the oncoming experiment what it is the next step the uh, good question once you find it what happens what happens is if you know the frequency then every university can have an axion dark matter experiment right now we don't know the frequency so you have a millions millions channels right it's like in, on the radio you try to find uh, but you have to integrate for a long time so you sit at one station for a long time and you may be able to hear the whispering uh, noise coming out of the big bang right of the, that time and, and just that's not possible for every university to have axion dark matter experience but once you know the frequency you know you can tune there and then you can look at the how the frequency moves as a function of time because the earth moves in that uh, dark matter halo and the sun moves right and then the earth with the uh, day and night and and uh, the seasons and so on so that velocity drifts the frequency around. So it can tell you about the distribution of dark matter, the way, the direction it comes. And sometimes they may come in a very narrow lines, streams of dark matter. Imagine, you have streams of dark matter. And so you'll, you'll be able to open up that veil and look in a different way. And several experiments can correlate together and see how this coherent state can move up or down, and you can see all sorts of things. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. We are not going to, to, to rest before we have a complete picture of what uh, axions, uh, how they behave and how they stream around the Earth. Thank you very much. I have a question related to the lecture and the way we um, notice, we detect the axon field. So uh, we know that dark matter is being called dark for the fact that it does not interact with the electromagnetic uh, uh, waves and does not have any interaction with in electromagnetic um, interaction. So, but still, in order to detect the axon field, we launch a very huge magnet, magnetic field, and we detect the electric field. Does that mean that it's still like electromagnetic interaction or is it some other kind of interaction? No, electromagnetic, that's right. You, you got it right. It's, uh, when we say dark matter, it doesn't interact with regular matter. First of all, we know it interacts gravitationally, but also it interacts very faintly with uh, ordinary magnet via electromagnetism, and also with nuclear mass a little bit, just faintly, and so on. There are ways, different ways. The, actually, the gradient of that field acts like a magnetic field. So that's the other thing we are going to do, find out what is the gradient of that, uh, of that field as a, as a function of time and space, and uh, we'll be able to, to characterize it all together. So it, it's dark because it's very faint interaction. To say zero is not correct. Uh, professor, I have one question. So about what we know so far about the behavior of dark matter, do we observe any similarities in the behavior as like normal visible matter or are the behaviors very different and contrasting? Right, uh, you, when the astrophysicists model the uh, formation of the universe, the galaxies in the universe and so on, they need to put the interaction uh, part and how fast they move and so on. So, yes, there are a couple of things. The axions are so-called cold dark matter. There are, they were candidates like uh, hot dark matter that they move too much, but then when we look at the large scale structure, they, if they move fast, then they would be able to escape the pot gravitational potential and they would erase the large scale structure. So we know it's not hot. We know that it's cold. We know a few things. We know the distribution. We know the distribution from the distribution of galaxies in that big halo, and so on and so forth. So, and then the interaction cannot be too large because uh, the, it would show up. So we have con good constraints. Yeah? 
one of the thing that uh, actually surprised me is that the fact that dark matter help us not to throw out because we are, as you said under your lecture, we are um, in the speed of 0.1 uh, uh, meter per second, I guess, and 0.1 percent of the speed of the light. No, it's incredible. Absolutely. I mean, people worry about uh, traveling with uh, you know 100 kilometers per hour and so on. But the, the, the solar system moves already with 0.1% of the speed of light. I estimated, we estimated that this, this speed is actually going to add about 20 minutes to everybody's life because of the relativistic effect. You get a, a little, you live longer because you, with respect to the if there are any people in the center of the galaxy that don't move around that much. So, and we owe this to dark matter, but we owe a lot more to dark matter because the galaxies wouldn't form uh, for us to be here to be asking the question without dark matter. So we needed that, yeah? So it's like the one that's uh, acting like a glue yes. for all the stars? That's right, that's right. Otherwise, if dark matter disappeared, we would be thrown out of the galaxy right away. I mean, Newton is very strict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Professor, when I think about dark matter, I kind of think about normal matter, and then I thought like normal matter has particles, like atoms and that. Is the same, is the same for dark matter or? Brilliant question, absolutely. Uh, the thing about this, uh, I heard a, a lecture once by a theory saying, you know, we have all these kind of particles in normal matter and so on, and we think of dark matter just being one thing. I mean, why? It could be a combination of different things. The problem at this point is that we don't know. But it's possible that there is a vector dark matter, scalar dark matter, and so on and so forth. Yeah, pseudo-scalar. And, and so, so it is possible to have that, the different kinds of dark matter. We don't know the combination. As I said, we will have sensitivity in 1 to 25 gigahertz to sense the axions, even if they are only 10% of the local dark matter halo density, 10%. When we started doing this, uh, uh, putting together this uh, center. Nobody thought we, could, we would be able to reach even 100% of, uh, ac of uh, axions being the dark matter. Now, we project our sensitivity will be such that we can tell even 10%, and that is very important. That's good. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, thank you very much. I wish we could have much time to discuss about this uh, issue, which is a burning issue in science. Uh, but due to time, we're going to uh, finish our discussion in here. Uh, before I conclude, uh, I would like to pass to Professor, is there anything you'd like to invite uh, your listeners about uh, dark matters? Just look about the dark matter. And if you have any questions, please uh, send me an email or visit our lab. I mean, it's a great place to be. Now, I mean, uh, very soon we are going to turn on the big magnet and, and that will uh, constrain a little bit the, the visit, the lab visit, but we can arrange. So when the magnet is off, you can come around and take a look. Well, Interesting. So uh, I, I think I may give like, uh, well, 30 seconds for every panelist and my moderator to conclude what you have learned from this discussion. Well, thank you very much for having us here. And today I learned that most of the universe, it's made out of dark matter. When I first came here, I thought it, like most of the things were normal matter. But thanks to Professor and his lecture, now we know it's the other way around. So thank you very much. Uh, for me, it's been an honor to listen for such a lecture, and it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, what I learned today was that dark matter is not completely dark, that it does still interact with electromagnetic waves. And that was the big uh, changing point for me. So that's definitely something new. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, for the very illuminating lecture, Professor. And for me, I think the most exciting point was to know that there are so many open questions in the research. So it's a very active field and I would love to contribute it, it, to it in my own capacity. Thank you.
Well, we're here at the end. So for me, it was quite a fabulous and interesting lecture I had today. And I understand that dark matter is a glue for every one of us to stay together. And well, that's the end. Thank you very much for listening to this program. Mm -hmm.